Oh boy, special guest Chad Ford on the show today. So you know we're going to be talking about the draft, of course, <laughs> on today's Locked On Maps. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Luka Doncic, and this is Locked On Mavericks Podcast. Hey, hey, Dallas Mavericks are NBA champions. don't believe you shouldn't be here and welcome you are locked on to the dallas mavericks my name is nick angstead media member and coordinator for the locked on podcast network and joining me as always my co-host contributor at mavs.com the draft dude the one we're thinking what you got for me isaac harris I don't have any cool intro today because we're joined by literally my favorite guy who's covered the NBA draft for so long. And literally, I don't think I've read as many words or listened to many, as many words about the, the draft over the years than the one and only Chad Ford. Chad, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I, I love the draft. I love this time of year. I got to say that I like dream about the draft at this point. So that's <laughs> probably not great, but I, I will wake up some mornings confused about, wait, did uh, the Rockets take Scotty Barnes at two? And <laughs> it's, it was a no, dream. no, or we're still a week away. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely love this time of year. We're almost there with Luca having Luca dreams and thinking about like, it's, it's almost gotten to that point with us having talked about him for so long now, a couple years, maybe we'll get there, but uh, yeah. All right. And I have to read this, by the way, this is our, our title sponsor today. So I'm not just trying to hype up Chad, but it literally says NBA draft goat, Chad Ford, locked on NBA draft host, Rafael Barlow and locked on NBA host, John Krause will be live this year covering the NBA draft here in Texas at the WFAA studio. So we'll be here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, brought to you by Built Bar. Get the local expert analysis on each pick. Follow Locked On NBA on YouTube and watch our live coverage on July 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Also follow Locked On Network on Twitter. All right, today we're going to be getting into the 2020 NBA Draft for the Mavericks. Going a little bit of a, a look back because you said something that was incredibly prophetic on our Locked On NBA live stream show that just became an, a huge story. It was very small at the time, and then it just blew up completely with the athletic article. We're going to talk about this year's draft to see if the Mavericks can get back in, maybe a couple of targets if the Mavericks decide to buy in or things like that. And then uh, what should we expect from a brand new front office looking at a draft? Uh, and things like that. So we're going to get into that with Chad Ford. Uh, so let's start with it. Uh, I, I kind of just want to play this video straight up, like straight out of the bat. Uh, this was us on the live stream last year, the Locked On NBA Draft live stream show. There's obviously David Locke. Twitter, by the way, I think just devalues these videos like later because the quality is much worse than it was. But uh, this is us on that draft night. And uh, I'm going to play this video and people hopefully can listen and hear uh, a, a buzzword and a name that, that came up in this video. Green, that's a, I think Josh Green over Sadiq Bay is a fairly significant surprise to the way this draft was broken down, Chad. For sure. I think we thought Bay was like one of the high risers in this draft that, that because his floor was um, pretty high that he was going to jump ahead of some of these guys like Green. But, you know, Green is younger uh, he certainly has the ability to defend multiple positions. He tested as one of the best athletes in this draft. A lot of questions about his jump shot here. Um, the analytics guys liked him. Uh, I, I know there's going to be some teams in the 20s that are going to be uh, upset um, that he's not on the board, but we'll be probably pretty happy that Bay is. Nick, what's your reaction to Josh Green? Yeah, Josh Green, a little bit of a surprise for me, at least. Isaac and I on Lockdown Mavs have been talking about Sadiq Bay all the time, saying could they trade up for him? Could they go get a guy like that? Seemed like he'd be a perfect fit. But Josh Green, another 3 and D type guy as well that they could go get. Uh, it's interesting that Chad Ford mentions uh, the analytics guys really like him because the Mavs have Haralaba Balgaris in their front office, and he's in their war room right now with Donnie Nelson. And so I wonder if that had anything to do with this pick he you know being a scambling type guy all about the numbers i wonder if he had anything to do with this type of a pick uh but you get another you know defensive wing to bring into the Ma into the mavericks fold and they definitely need guys like that to play defense i, and I think i think he i think he did um actually i, I think that he's playing a, an increased role in their front office and and you know mark cuban has always been intrigued um, by the analytic side of things and and uh i he he may have the ear of mark cuban right now 
He may have the ear of Mark Cuban right now. That could not have been more true now, like uh, basically a year later from that. Take us back to that moment and uh, what tipped you off to think that, that Haralaba was possibly having a bigger role in the front office? Well, you do a lot of homework before the draft and it's it's actually pretty typical that the night of the draft or a day or two before the draft, these teams really shut up. But what I had heard consistently out of the Mavs front office and their scouts was that they loved Sadiq Bey, that they were, like you said, trying to figure out maybe how did they move up in the draft to get him. They, they saw him as a perfect fit on a team that was going to go and really try to be a, a serious playoff contender next next year. And that was the thing about Sadiq Bey. He was the guy that I think was in that portion of the draft that everybody saw as the immediate contributor, a guy that could come in, stretch the floor, really help the team right away. And, and that was their guy. And I had also heard complaints over the, over really the course of an entire year um, about the role uh, that certain other individuals were playing within the organization, how they had struggled to get Mark Cuban to pay attention to traditional scouting um, and whether Donnie Nelson, Tony Ronzoni, the rest of that crew really continued to have the ear of, of Mark Cuban. And so when, Josh Green, who was an analytics darling, goes to the Mavs. It was just me connecting the dots really quickly between those conversations uh, about what, what had been happening and the fact that Bay wasn't there. When I knew that was Donnie Nelson's guy, when I knew that was Tony Ronzoni's guy, when I knew that that was the scouting department's guy and they passed on him, that was a pretty clear signal to me that they just don't have the juice that they have in the front office anymore. I think it's actually fascinating to me that it took an entire year really mm -hmm. for that to come to head. And then of course the athletic article sort of lays it all out in, in a way that I actually found uh, to be fairly accurate from what I'd been hearing uh, over the last year. I know, I know Mark Cuban had a different, different take on it, but, um, <laughs> but that, that's, that's what I'd been hearing. Uh, out of out of Dallas for a while. So it did make a lot of sense. I mean, it made a lot of sense to me that when it happened the way that it did, um, it went down. And look, this tension, by the way, I, you know, I should point out, isn't always a bad thing. Uh, there's lots of front offices that bring in people with different perspectives and they debate, sometimes scream at each other on draft night over prospects. That in and of itself isn't uncommon. It isn't uncommon for people to feel frustrated on draft night because the team didn't draft the the player that they thought um, the team should draft. We we talk all the time about consensus. And not only is there not an NBA consensus, there's rarely a team consensus <laughs> um, in, in, a, in a draft room on draft night about, you know, who that prospect should be. And so none of that is particularly out of the ordinary. What is out of the out of the ordinary is to have someone who's really framed as a consultant. Uh, mm. ultimately being the person that the owner leans on to make the, to make the final decisions, not your general manager, not your scouting staff consistently that that will happen from time to time, but it was starting to happen consistently in Dallas. And I think that that was the sign. Yeah. We, we hyped up Sadiq Bay so much heading into that draft. We knew the Mavericks liked him. Uh, we knew, you know, Ron Zoni, Donnie and them had a great relationship with, you know, Jay Wright and Villanova team USA connection and all of that. And, uh, Josh Green goes, you know, I'd heard on that on draft night that night, there was some, there was some tension. I didn't know how bad it was on that, but just you shedding that light, I think is, uh, important for us to see that because even us like the, what if, cause Sadiq Bay had such a good year and, you know, Josh Green struggled to kind of find a role for Dallas this year. And we ask ourselves, I'm like, man, what if, would he have gotten more playing time in Dallas? I have a question for you for the other, you know, they took three draft picks that night and Tyrell Terry, Tyler Bay, Josh Green. Could you give us like your take on them? Like if you're, if a Mavs fan sitting there saying right now, Chad Ford, who would you be the most excited about out of those three? And I guess I, Josh Green could be the, the answer because he's an 18th overall pick, but which one of those guys would you be excited about as a Mavs fan going into the rest of their career? Well, one, one interesting thing was that the part of the, part of the thinking too from Donnie and, and the rest of the scouting staff is they knew who their head coach was Rick Carlisle. Rick Carlisle doesn't like to play rookies, not named Luka Doncic. Even I think Luka Doncic, it was probably pulling teeth at times for Rick Carlisle to give him the role that they, they gave him in Dallas. And, and that's, that's Rick going way back. That's Rick in Detroit. Um, you know, you, you see this sort of happening over and over again with Rick. And so not only are you giving Rick a rookie, which he, 
generally doesn't prefer anyway, but then you're giving a young and experienced rookie like Josh Green, the chances that that guy was going to get any minutes. I don't think that's completely on Josh Green. Mm -hmm. I think that also has a lot to do with coaching. And, you know, again, you read in the athletic article, sometimes the tension between the front office and the coaching staff about, you know, who gets minutes, who plays and what have you. I'm sure Josh Green was one of those conversations that came up because you've got Again, a consultant who's thrown all their chips in and Josh Green and then Josh Green can't get minutes, um, you know, on, on the team. And and so I think I think some of that is we have to withhold a little bit about what we think about Josh Green's rookie season mm -hmm. because who his head coach is. Now, look, will Jason Kidd give him minutes? I don't know. I don't I don't think that's the direction necessarily that Dallas is going either. I think Kidd could also be the head coach who may not. Um, really want to again invest in developing a young player right now. And, and look, that's always again intention in front offices and coaching staff. Coaches want to win now. They want players that can help them win now. What are we hearing out of out of out of Indiana right now? Uh, where Rick Carlisle is, trade the thirteenth pick, get me Eric Gordon, get mm -hmm. me CJ McCollum, get me somebody who can come in and play right now. Don't draft uh, at the thirteenth pick. You know someone who can't can't come in and play with me. That that's just the tension. It's not just Rick Carlisle. So I, I think Mav fans just have to be patient uh, with Green. I I think that he's got a lot of talent. I really like Tyrell Terry. Um, to be honest, coming into this, I I thought he is a a small guard who could really stroke the basketball. And and while I didn't think he's as dynamic as uh, let's say a Trey Young or someone like that, like maybe a Seth Curry type of of role that he plays going forward again he very weak wasn't physically mature probably needed that year um you know frankly uh to continue to develop but i, I think he's an interesting prospect and then you know bay who was a guy that the scouting the scouting crew really did like by the way this was this was probably the one where the scouts got their way uh with tyler bay as an, an elite athlete and uh again i i didn't have a problem with any of the the Mavs picks. I, I believe actually I gave them an A on, uh, on draft night. It was sort of a combination of that and, and their trade, but I didn't have a problem with any of them, but it, but the Sadiq Bay, Bay thing is like a serious question, but I, I am look as a draft Nick. It's somebody who just isn't mired to particular teams and their rebuild. The general rule of thumb is that you take the younger player, you take the higher upside player that actually, even though it seems so risky to fans, if you look at it historically, it generally pans out better than playing safe and getting the 22-year-old guy who can come in and sort of help you right now. Uh, Sadiq Bey, I liked in the draft, had a lot of skills, but he was also a little bit older and you know lacked that sort of elite athleticism. The upside wasn't there that there was with a Josh Green. And so I, I think there's there were reasons to argue for that. I just think Dallas was an unfortunate fit for him uh, given his trajectory and development. It's a lot of good stuff. We'll be back with more from Chad Ford about the 2021 draft. We got to ask if the Mavs got back in, what would they do? What are potential targets? We'll talk about that. But I got to tell you first about Rock Auto. This episode is brought to you by Rock Auto with the ever increasing number of makes and models. It's now impossible for your local chain auto parts stores, the ones on the side of the road, to stock all the parts that you need. So why would you go there, try and look for the part? You have to go to the counter, and they're like, oh, we have it in the back. They go check in the back. They actually don't have it, and then you have to go back to the counter. They just order online anyway. You can just not waste all that time. Instead, go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck, and you can see that their prices are always reliably low for every single customer, not just the professional's but the do-it-yourselfers as well. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in there. How did you hear about us, Box? So they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need, rockauto.com. We're here with the draft goat, according to our promo today, Chad Ford. What do you think about being called the, the draft goat? Like, that's that's such a big title. Yeah, it's, it's awkward. Uh, and, you know, you were reading that same copy, and sometimes I don't, carefully look at the copy before I go. And so when I started reading it for mine, like that came out of my mouth and I'm like, okay, we're going to read, we're going to redo this. Not a thing Chad Ford would say. I don't think, uh, no. Um, you know, I, I, all it really means is that I'm old and I've been around a long time. I mean, that's really, you know, and you can start to see the gray on the beard. Like that, that's, that's all it means is that when I started, I didn't have any of this beard and I had a lot more hair on the top of my head. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's experience. That's who I want to go to for my draft knowledge. For sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, all right. For sp speaking, speaking of draft knowledge, 2021 NBA draft, we just launched the ultimate mock draft that you're all over, uh, breaking down some of these picks. The Mavs do not have a pick. So it's kind of weird that you're on this podcast today. Uh, the Mavs don't have a pick at all. But let's say that this Mavs crew, this new front office, and uh, Mark Cuban decided to get back into the draft. Let's start with just the, you know, the lottery. What, who are guys in the lottery that you think the Mavericks should start looking at? Or if they got a lottery pick, uh, let's say, you know, in like the 9 to 13 range or something like that. Who are some some targets that would fit well with this Mavs team? Yeah, it's, it's a little bit hard to know exactly how the Mavs would get there uh, without, you know, break. obviously they're not trading Luka and they're not probably going to trade Porzingis. And frankly, you know, what Porzingis trade value is in the league right now is a little bit hard to get my arms around. I've actually been trying to ascertain that because that does seem to me to be one plausible avenue uh, for Dallas, though they do seem, I think, to be more in win now mode than building through the draft. But, you know, Franz Wagner is a guy that I think you would immediately look at and say he's a Dallas type of player. He's an analytics darling uh, all the way. Alpern and Singun out of Turkey, same thing. So, on some analytics models, he's ranked number one in wow. this draft just off the uh, level of production that he had in Turkey, where as an 18 year old, he was the Turkish League MVP. Wow. And the Turkish League, by the way, for those that don't follow the Turkish league is one of the, you know, two or three best leagues in Europe. So it's a very legitimate league with former NBA players, um, you know, spread throughout the league. And so for an 18 year old to come and do it, really, there's only one precedent for someone doing it like that. And that's Luka Doncic. Uh, and so when you're seeing Sengun put up those numbers like that, it's really interesting. And the same kind of knocks against Sengun. He's not the greatest athlete in the world. You know what, you know, what position does he actually sort of play in the NBA? I think they're more legitimate with Sengun because he, he plays as a center, but plays as sort of an old school center right now in Turkey with the league just evolving away from players like that. But it does seem to me the one thing I'll say that he has in common with Doncic is he's got like a savant esh feel for the game. It's otherworldly for a player his age, the way he sees the game, the way he, especially offensively, um, what he's able to do. And so, you know, those are the first two players that like, you know, come to mind given what Mavs have liked in the past, both that the, they're not afraid to go after international prospects and two, they have, they have a history of uh, lately of relying on analytics to sort of tell them who who they should be drafting in that range. And I'm, I'm actually going to th throw another international player out there because we just saw him play against Team USA uh, yeah. last night in Vegas, Usman Garuba, who is getting significant minutes on Real Madrid uh, this year, um, already is built like a veteran, NBA veteran, and already can defeat. He was de defending Kevin Garnett or Kevin Durant last night, uh, which is, you know, which is phenomenal for a 19 yeah. year old, right? And probably could step in and do. And I, I think that's the thing with rookies. If coaches are more likely to play rookies, if they're not going to just get destroyed defensively. And one thing about Garuba is that he would not. And, and so you could see him coming in and adding toughness and athleticism. He's got a crazy motor, uh, the way he plays the game. All three of those would be guys that if I was Dallas, I'd be eyeing in this draft right now. He Garuba's you said the motor. That's exactly where I was going to hit. I love when players, and this is going to sound super cliche, but I love when young players try hard and yeah. he just like, you can never have to doubt that with him. And I was actually watching saying good stuff yesterday. And when I was doing stuff around the house and his spin and drop, like his spin off the block and drop, like step. That's like, it, yeah. It's, it's really impressive. Okay. Into the first round. If Dallas trades into the end of the first round, like 20 to 30, Somewhere through there, they pick up one of those Houston picks. Who is a guy or a couple of guys that you're like, all right, that could be a Dallas fit? Well, I think at that point, you know, and maybe some Dallas fans are, you know, excited about this. You, you start to lose the, you know, the international guys. I, they're either going to go, I think, fairly like in the late mid to late lottery or they're going to be in the second round. And so you start thinking about, again, in my opinion, guys that could actually, you know, help Dallas next year, uh, have a chance of getting on the floor with Jason Kidd as their head coach. So Chris Duarte out of Oregon is certainly a guy to look at. Uh, I, my guess is the analytics crew is very conflicted with him because there's like this one sort of truth 
that comes out of almost all analytics models, which is the, by the time you're 22 or 23, you're not a good draft prospect. It doesn't matter what sort of numbers that you put up, that the, the history of these, these guys at this age coming in and being really good prospects are low. Duarte is 24 already, Whoa. which makes him one of the oldest draft prospects that we've ever seen uh, as a potential first rounder. But even that, John Hollinger, who relies heavily on analytics, still has Duarte in his top 20 because he was that good uh, at Oregon last year. He he's does everything that you want in a, in a 3 and D wing and certainly a guy that has the maturity to come in and play right away. So, you know, you start with Duarte. Uh, I think he's sort of an interesting, uh, you know, prospect there. Uh, you know, other guys that, that could be there, Jared Butler, uh, who was just cleared by the NBA uh, – medically a guy that led Baylor to a national title can play both backcourt positions, just plays with such maturity, uh, such great defender uh, coming out of Baylor. My guess is he slides a little bit in the draft because of just maybe a little bit of concern that he had to go through all those medical uh, tests and what have you. But I think he's a safe first round prospect and certainly a guy that I again could see come in, bring toughness, be able to play both backcourt positions and, and be a guy that Dallas could, could really use. It sounds a little like Brunson to me, like just, just a little Brunson. -y. Maybe not the defense, yeah. but uh, I think the m more upside though than Brunson. Frankly, mm -hmm. um, I think he's a little bit better athlete. I, you know, Brunson's turned out to be a really good, uh, you know, really good rotation player in the NBA. But I, I think Butler could be more than that. Uh, coming up, let's get into some more second round picks. They decided to, to buy into that and then talk about what does a brand new front office do for, for draft prep? These guys are starting like what a month or a couple weeks before the draft started. So let's get into that with Chad Ford coming up. But before we do, I got to tell you about betonline.ag. It's the fastest and easiest way to put some money down on sports. Uh, right now, they have a couple of draft props right now. Uh, be kind of interested now that we have uh, Chad Ford on. You just mentioned Alfred Sangoon over under 13th pick. The under is minus 140. The over is plus uh, 100. So they're thinking that he goes uh, 13 or higher. Would you bet on that? Yeah, I actually think he would. Uh, I, 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 it's, it's polarized in this draft, but you look at Charlotte and what Charlotte needs and then San Antonio sitting there at 12 mm -hmm. and what they need. Uh, those are, and Let's see what Oklahoma City does. You know, they've got 16 and 18. Uh, they're they're always looking to move up. He's an uh, Oklahoma City player all the way as well. I know they're sitting at 16, but I'm not sure that they'll be there at 16 on draft night. So those are all teams that I could see targeting Sangoon at, in the lottery. Another prop is Chris Duarte. We just talked about over under 21 and a half. The uh, over is minus 150. So that's the favorite that they think he'll go lower than uh, than 21. Uh, no, I, I, I would, I would bet against that. I think Duarte is getting looks at golden state at 14, uh, with, uh, with again, the warriors looking at getting a, a, you know, a prospect that could come and help him right away. If they keep that pick, which is a big, if Washington likes Duarte, uh, a lot at 15 and the Knicks at 19, those are all very plausible landing spots, spots for Duarte. There you go. Take that info right now. Go to betonline.ag. Use the promo code LOCKDOWN. You'll get a 50% welcome bonus to your first deposit. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. All right, Isaac, we are joined by Chad Ford. We're talking about if the Mavericks got back into the draft somehow. Let's go to the second round. Chad Ford, if the Mavericks were able to buy a pick somehow to, to get into it or trade for, for something, send, I don't know, if they wanted Ty if Tyrell Terry wanted to go somewhere else and they're like, let's send Tyrell Terry for a second round pick. Who are some you know, some sleeper type second round picks that the Mavericks could go after. Well, let's give a shout out to Raphael Barlow uh, from the Locked On NBA Draft podcast, who has been pushing Vrenz Blindberg from Belgium all year, was not on a lot of NBA radar screens, uh, but I think Raphael was right about him. I think more of the teams have, have looked at him and pushed for him. Here's a seven footer who can handle the ball, can pass the ball, can shoot the ball. He's skinny. And he didn't play against great competition in Belgium, but he's a guy that I think Dallas could take and perhaps stash uh, mm -hmm. for a year, maybe overseas or two, or or put in the G League and let him develop there. But with big, big upside, and you know another guy again, Rafael Barlow was all over him early on. Ibu Baji, out of Senegal, playing in Spain right now, one of the most freakish athletes you'll ever see in a seven footer, like freakish like Dwight Howard-esque 
uh, athlete and body right now. Wow. Doesn't really know how to play basketball yet. It's still, it's still very much in infancy there, but you can't teach that level of coordination, explosiveness, athleticism, body. You know, everybody's talking about Kai Jones going as a lottery pick who also is really just in the beginning stages of figuring out the game of basketball. Everybody's drafting Kai Jones because of the athletic upside. Baji is a second round uh, guy that again, you let develop overseas and you bet on down the road, I think is, is a, is a really, really good bet. And then if you want a non international player, uh, Herb Jones out of Alabama is a guy that I think uh, is a really intriguing prospect again, because his ability to defend three to four positions, to be able to handle the ball uh, a bit, you know, questionable jump shot. I think that's going to be his swing skill of whether he makes that in the NBA, but Herb Jones could be a really intriguing second round prospect in my opinion. So with Nico stepping in year one, uh, honestly, month one, what's the you know he even said he he answered uh rafael's question at the presser the other day about uh you know drafts and scouting drafts he's like hey i've been scouting drafts for the past 19 years so he's he is saying the right things what's the biggest thing what's the biggest hurdle for them to jump over right now of just taking over this job and and honestly like what do you expect from dallas do you expect dallas to just stand pat because it is such a new thing happening so quick yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't do anything major right now as they let Nico get his feet wet. I, I think the trend towards general managers like Nico make a lot of sense to me um, because of their ability to relate to players, uh, which is just huge. Players have more power than they've ever had in the NBA. And, and that's, that's meant that a lot of the ways that old school GMs have sort of approached this just don't work. Um, anymore. Um, he obviously has experience in contract negotiation. He obviously has experience in recruiting. I mean, there's a lot of things that, and, and the connections are deep uh, for him, uh, deeply respected throughout the league. And so, you know, this isn't someone who's going to just, you know, pick up the phone and be like, who are you or what have you. Now, with that said, the NBA is like flying a 747. There are so many different mechanisms, salary cap rules, uh, ways that things are done in the league that he won't have a clue about, not because he's not intelligent or isn't smart or isn't going to be great at it just because he's never done it before. And one of the advantages of bringing up someone in the, in the franchise that has a lot of experience doing that is that that, that is the, the goal. So as long as he surrounds himself with people that really sort of understand the intricacies of the salary cap, the intricacies of how sort of trades are done in the NBA, you know, sort of working through all of that stuff, he's going to be fine. And by the way, I don't think your head guy has to have those skills as long as he has someone on your staff that does and you trust them enough to sort of understand what's going, going through. And it, I wouldn't be surprised to see maybe Dallas make another uh, you know, move for a yet another sort of veteran executive that, you know, as a consultant or someone that comes in and continues to sort of help uh, with those things right now. But I, I, I expect, I could be wrong, but I expect that we're going to have a fairly quiet, uh, you know, draft and free agency as he gets set. This was about placating Luca, making sure that Luca is comfortable with the direction that the Mavs are going to go. And then I think they're going to have to just figure out where to go uh, mm -hmm. with this team next. And, and I'm not sure that this summer is going to be the greatest time to figure that out for Dallas, unless something really falls in their lap that's really intriguing. I think this is more what plays out at the trade deadline at, as we get closer you know, to midway point of the season into next summer, they're going to be ready to go. And so if I think if Dallas fans can be patient, this could really pay off for Dallas. Uh, but I would, I would be wary of making too big a move too quickly, um, just given the inexperience uh, that's there. The other thing that he's just going to have to, and you know, maybe I'm going to get in trouble in the locked on maps talking about this is Jason. Jason Kidd is not only a formidable head coach, but everywhere he's gone, he has gotten heavily involved in the front office matters um, that he's been at. Um, sometimes much to the chagrin of their general managers. And so, one of the things that I think is really going to have to be worked on is Nico and Jason Kidd's relationship because coaches will always want to run the franchise and get the prospects that they think are going to help them win tomorrow night. That's, mm -hmm. that's what they care about, right? And general managers have to take a much longer view uh, of, of this and try to decide, 
okay, maybe he helps us win tomorrow, but does he help us win in round three of the playoffs or does he help us in, um, in three years? And, and kid has a reputation throughout the league of not caring about any of that. Who is it tomorrow? He gets enamored with certain prospects. He gets enamored, frankly, sometimes with, you know, he he's managed and rep by Excel and other Excel clients. Uh, there's been a long history of him, you know, pushing for that. So, you know, when he pushes and it was him who pushes for Michael Carter Williams to go, uh, you know, to the Bucks and that, in that big deal, Michael Carter Williams and Excel client that, you know, Jason had sort of met and, and, and really pushed for, Let me Google that's it. the thing. Excel, that, <laughs> Excel clients. Let me just Google that real quick. Yeah. You know, go look at, go look at the Excel's clients and, and, and see, and you know, this is something Nico is just going to have to have the juice um, to be able to tell your head coach at sometimes, no, I'm going to, you know, you're going to have to play the guys that I give you that we're going to, you, you have a voice in this matter, but you're not the voice. Mm. And, and, and I think, I think that's been hard for Jason Kidd in the past, given his type A personality, given how strong he is and this as opinionated as he is, that to me is going to, if you see a lot of changes, uh, that would be the thing that I would be unsteady about. And I'd just be watching as a, as a Mavs, a Mavs fan. I think Jason Kidd can coach. I don't think he's got any business being a, a general manager. Mm. Well, let's hope all the stuff at the press conference that he said, I have learned, I've grown. Let's hope that's part of it, right? <laughs> yeah. Could I, could I ask you a bigger Mavs question real quick? Is there anything that you're – you talk to teams, agents, people all the time right now, especially during the busiest time of the year. Is there anything you're hearing Mavs-wise, Porzingis-wise, even not even like – rumor stuff but just like what's the general talk around the mavericks right now around the league i i i, I th first of all i think the nico um signing nico was very well received around the league generally i i think it was much more media that were miffed by this than than anybody in the league who saw this coming years ago and in fact i think he's turned down multiple offers uh in the past uh and so the fact that that mark got him I think is just generally considered a, a coup for them and, and the right move. I, I would say that the Jason Kidd hiring was raised. A lot more eyebrows were raised around the league about that and, and why they made that uh, choice, why they didn't uh, bring in Jamal Mosley uh, to, to coach, to coach there. Uh, I think given the developmental curve of Dallas and everything else, I think there's a lot more question marks there. And then as far as the roster, one of the things I've been trying to ascertain is what is Christoph Porzingis' trade value on the market? Because he's really the chip, I think, that they have if they want to make a, a significant move, uh, whether that's in the draft or just in, you know, in swapping out players. And I, I think a lot of teams are trying to get to the bottom of what happened with Porzingis uh, in the playoffs. You know, is, is this an issue where, you know, health and just – motivation and drive and all that anymore just isn't the same as what it was. And he's just not never going to be the player that he once was in, in New York, or is this just the case of sort of miscast wrong role, playing the wrong direction? Um, you know, COVID frustration, all this sort of stuff and getting him into a new environment, you get back to the Christophs Porzingis that, that I loved and that lots of people really loved when they saw him, uh, you know, play in New York and at times in Dallas, uh, you know, as well. And, and I don't know the answer to that. I have been trying to get a handle on that. I just put together a trades column, like five proposed trades and I wanted Porzingis to be one of them. But at the end of the day, I just couldn't figure out what his trade value was enough to actually even make a fake proposed trade, uh, for Porzingis that made much sense. Interesting. Good stuff from Chad Ford. You can find him on the Chad Ford's NBA Big Board podcast, as well as uh, nbabigboard.com. Go subscribe to that. Always great stuff. Of course, the ultimate locked on uh, mock draft. There's the live show that'll be at WFAA. You can watch that streaming lot. Chad, you're just everywhere. Like the draft is just, it's exploding with stuff right now. Busy, busy times, but Anything good that times. I missed? Good times. No, no, I think you got it. <laughs> okay. There you go, guys. Thanks so much for listening to Locked On Mavs. Peace out. Boom.